Hey, if you're wanting to learn how to read and study the Bible, you have come to the right place. I pray that by the end of this, you know, this will really benefit you and help you sharpen your Bible study skills and add new skills to your tool belt, all right? We're in Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 8. And before we get there, I want you to know we have a completely free Bible study course you can take linked in the description below or on our website at abovereproachministry.com. So, Hebrews chapter 3, let's back it up actually to verse 7. It says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says... Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. So if I just jumped into this passage, I started my, let's just say I started my devotional here, I wouldn't understand what's going on. What's happening here is the author of Hebrews is making a quotation from the Old Testament. He's quoting a passage, um, I forget where. I want to say it's Psalms. I could be wrong, though, okay? So correct me if I'm wrong. In fact, I don't want to be wrong, so let me look it up real quick. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. This quotation is from, hey, Psalm 95. I wasn't too far off. So know that. The author of Hebrews is making a point that Jesus is faithful over God's house. We are his house. Uh, but that's going to look like a certain way of life, right? Children of God will uh, act and live a certain way. And then verse 7 through 11 is going to be a quotation from Psalm 95. And this quote is going to reinforce um, or clarify the points he's made in the previous verses. So I want to think about, as I read this, what are the main ideas the author of Hebrews has you know, uh, put forth in the immediately preceding verses? He's talked about, again, Jesus is over God's house as a faithful son. So I want to think about that as I read this quotation. He talks about, we are the household or the family of God, the children of God. If this ends up being our experience, we hold fast. These are characteristics of a child of God, right? Hold fast our confidence, our boasting and our hope. So I want to think about those ideas and have them at the front of my mind as I'm reading this quotation, because the word therefore he lets us know he's making this scripture from Psalm 95, uh, you know, connect to or reinforce what he's already said. So it says, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So I have a few questions. And again, when you read the Bible, I've said this in episode after episode, it is so important that you learn how to ask the right questions. What is the rebellion being referred to? And you might not know the answer up front, like immediately, but at least you're asking a question that can eventually be answered as you continue reading. And if you keep reading, you'll probably get the answer to that. What is the rebellion he's referring to? He probably won't leave you hanging. Or what does it mean to harden your hearts, right? That's another question. And, and, and when is today, right? Is today a day in the past or is today actually right now where I am in my modern time, right? These are questions that we have. And we should ask because as I read, hopefully... By having those questions already in my head, I'll have those questions answered and then I'll have more clarity into the text, all right? So I want to highlight a few things that I noticed. When I, when I read the Bible, people always ask, hey, what's your color coding, you know, uh, highlighting method? What's, your, what's the method to your madness? And the answer is, it, it's pure madness. That's what it is. It's, there's no method. Every time I read the Bible, it's different. So right now, what I'm going to highlight is any action words attributed to the listener or to the the reader or the audience, okay? Uh, it says, Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts, as in the rebellion, on the day of testing in the wilderness. So remember how we asked, well, what's the rebellion? Well, he immediately answers and clarifies what, what rebellion event he's referring to. It was a day of testing in the wilderness, right? Well, when was that? There are a bunch of times when people in, in the wilderness rebelled against God. Well, he'll clarify even more where your fathers, so the, the you know, Israelite generation in the wilderness put God to the test. This is God speaking, um, where their fathers put you know, me to the test. They saw my works for 40 years. So there are some verbs attributed to, to the listener and the, the reader, rather, the audience, but there's also some verbs attributed, action words attributed uh, to the, you know, the wicked 
uh, rebels in the wilderness in the Old Testament, being the fathers of the Israelites, right? That that lo- the generation in the wilderness, I can't talk. They put God to the test. They saw His works, and whatever He's telling the audience in Hebrews to do, hear His voice. Don't harden your hearts. He's comparing it to the rebellion, or He's looking at the day of testing in the wilderness as an example of what not to do. So it reads like this. So when, when you read the Bible, I want to say a, a few things. I'm trying to organize my thoughts. Number one, when you see a quotation from somewhere else in the Bible, you want to go to the original quote. You want to go to that original context. So I would go to Psalm 95, and I just want to read the whole chapter. I want to understand the surrounding ideas. I want to understand the context, because however the author of Hebrews is employing this quotation, uh, it's going to not be disconnected from its original context. So if I understand the way Psalms 95 originally used the passage, I can understand uh, how the author is using it here in Hebrews and how he also might be adding to it by not adding to it, but clarifying what what was there the whole time by reading it through the lens of Jesus and looking back in hindsight and, and reading that. So when you read all that to say, when you read an Old Testament passage being quoted or somewhere else, just go to that original quote and read it in context. It'll help a lot. Um, And so he says, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion, which again, this is an event. He's saying, you know, if you harden your hearts, you'll be like the, the, your fathers who were in the wilderness in the rebellion when they put God to the test after seeing his works for 40 years. Right? So whatever he's, um, calling the audience to do, it is very important to understand what event he's likening or connecting uh, that call to. Because if I just, if I block this off and I go, hear his voice, don't harden your hearts, I can kind of, you know, define that and, and, you know, interpret that however I want. But when he adds the word, adds the word as, and he's saying, there's a specific kind of hardening that I'm thinking of. It's in the rebellion when your fathers put God to the test after seeing his works for 40 years. There's a comparison being drawn. It's not just that they hardened their hearts too. It's also that they saw his works and still rebelled. Just like he's telling the audience not to do when he says, don't harden your hearts after you hear his voice. So, when a comparison is drawn, this word as notes that, um, sometimes something is being uh, compared, I want to think about what's being compared. And if I list that out, I can make better sense of the text. Um, So let's keep reading. Whatever's happening here, the Israelites in the wilderness put God to the test, even after seeing his works for 40 years, they still rebelled, right? And this rebellion is something that is likened to what's called hardening your hearts, right? Therefore, God says, I was provoked with that generation. What generation, right? If I didn't pay attention to what was just said, I might have that question. What generation? Go back and read. This generation. When you read the Bible, read slow enough to make sense of the ideas and understand what's going on. Otherwise, you're just going to get to, you might read a lot and you might get far in that day's Bible reading, but you won't understand what you read and that's not really helpful. So, the word therefore here lets us know um, the conclusion, or rather the, the effect, the action that God takes, or what he wants to say about this event. He says, I was provoked with that generation, and I said, they always go astray in their heart. Now, I want to continue highlighting in yellow, whatever it is that... Um, uh, whatever action words are used of that wicked generation, they were, rebellion's not an action word, right? But it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a description of what they did. They put God to the test. They saw his works. They always go astray. They have not known his ways. And I want to highlight in orange how God responds. Now, the reason I'm doing this again is because um, uh, I was provoked. They put me to the test. They saw my works. Okay. The reason I want to do this is because Sometimes when I'm reading the Bible, the action words, the verbs that are used, really, really, really draw out the meaning of the text for me. Uh, sometimes I'll highlight the nouns or the adjectives or the, the description words. In this case, what I'm highlighting in yellow are the 
the verbs attributed to the wicked generation, and then in orange, the verbs attributed to God in response to their actions. They put him to the test after seeing his works. They went astray. They've not known his ways. Therefore, God is provoked with that generation. And what he says here, uh, and he says this, they always go astray in their heart. They've not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now, if I'm a new Bible student and I've never read the Old Testament, you probably have a lot of questions, right? I'd probably have a lot of questions. Uh, What does it mean that God is swearing in his wrath? I might go to, you know, Psalm 95 and, and look at the word in Hebrew translated wrath or here in the Greek, the word that's translated uh, into wrath. What does it mean that they're not entering into rest? What does it mean to enter into rest? Why, why is rest a concept that's being brought up? And I don't highlight this in yellow for any reason, just to draw your attention to it. Why is rest emphasized, right? Why is the fact that they're not entering his rest the result of their rebellion. So it goes like this. They rebelled. So they're not going to enter my rest. Well, if if I am a Bible student and I know about the Old Testament, I know exactly what he's referring to. It's when the Israelites said, yeah, we don't want to go in the promised land. We saw those giants. We'd rather disobey you. And God goes, okay, fine. You're not going to enter the promised land. I'll bring a new generation in, right? This is part of God's wrath, is this not entering into rest. So, So this is where... I'm trying to think of how to explain this the best way I can. When I read the Bible, there are certain ideas that just click and they go together so smoothly. So when I read verse 11 and he says, as I swore in my wrath, here's what God is saying out of not this emotional rage that consumes him. This is not God being controlled by his anger. This is the just uh, wrath that their sin is due, right? These wicked fathers in the wilderness, they've earned this wrath. God is, uh, you know, saying something in that deserved wrath they have. They've earned for themselves. And here's the statement he makes in that wrath. They shall not enter my rest. So this statement, what they don't get to do, is related to his wrath being released upon them for their rebellion. Does that make sense? And so sometimes these things come very easy for me to recognize. Other times, my brain just isn't working, and it's working over time, and I'm struggling. So my encouragement to you is when you read the Bible, um, do your best to do what Paul tells Timothy, study to show yourself approved, meditate, think through, exercise logic, cross-reference, do whatever you can to make sense of the text, right? Because this is one long quotation that does what? Now remember, we, we shouldn't isolate this quotation from the rest of this chapter, this whole quotation from Psalm 95 relates to what? The very last thing he said in holding fast our confidence and our, our boasting and our hope. Then he goes right into Psalm 95 and he recalls people who did not hold fast, people who did not boast in their hope, people that did not function as the people of God, you know, but they instead rebelled and tested God and rejected his word and they went astray. They've not known his ways. So I want to think about these things. We'll we'll end with this. These ideas all come together. So what I want to think about is how the wrath of God relates to someone not entering his rest. That's something worth meditating on. I also might want to think about how not entering his rest is related to not knowing his ways. Because who are the people that don't enter the rest of God? And you're probably wondering, well, how are you coming to these conclusions? Because I've highlighted all the different characteristics of the person being addressed, being, you know, described. This person doesn't enter the rest of God. They've never known God's ways. They always go astray in their heart. God is provoked with these people in a, in a wrathful way. There, there's justice that must be released upon them for their rebellion. They put God to the test, even though they've seen his works for 40 years. So the reason I can piece these things together is because these are all descriptions of the same kind of person. So how is it that them not entering rest relates to them not knowing his ways? Or how does them not knowing his ways uh, relate to them going astray in their heart? Because here, the author combines these two ideas. They always go astray in their heart, semicolon, they've not known my ways. So is it that they've They go astray because they don't know his ways or they don't know his ways uh, because they've chosen to go astray. 
You know, just some, some questions to ask. I want to do my best to connect all these ideas, right? And then as I do that, I'll get a clearer understanding on how this passage right here, verse 7 through 11, connects to the overall argument being put forth in chapter 3, which is, hey, hold fast your confidence, you know, and the boasting of your hope, uh, be the household of God, all these different things. And you'll see how verse 12 kind of ties this all up and brings it, brings us back to verse 6. So I'm not, I'm not making some unfounded connection. Verse 12 is going to bring us back to the original point being made in verse 6. And then he pauses, he references Psalm 95 to reinforce the command he's given them. Hey, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Right here. Don't harden your hearts. Uh, you know, if you're the Jewish audience receiving this, you go, ah, prove it. Well, let me remind you of the rebellion that took place in the wilderness on the day of testing, where God was put to test by these wicked people. They saw his works, they provoked God, they went astray, they have not known his ways, and they didn't enter his rest. Right? So sometimes when you read the Bible, notice any list that's developing. What I've highlighted is a list of characteristics of the people. And I've highlighted a list of any actions God makes in response to what they do. And then, you know, you go from there, right? So do your best when you read the Bible to take note and recognize any list that an author is developing. A list of events, a list of characters, a list of descriptions, a list of actions, right? A list of whatever it is. And then take note of what they all have in common, how they go together, how they relate, and what that emphasizes about the main point of the text or how those, those ideas you recognize relate to what's been said prior to this. Hopefully this has been helpful. I know my brain was a little scattered today, but um, I hope I was able to get my points across. Again, if you didn't already know this, we have a completely free, self-paced, online Bible study course you can take linked in the description below. We have a 40-day program, a 27-day, and an 11-day. They're all completely free because of generous supporters like you guys. So go and enjoy those if you really want to go deep into learning how to read and study the Bible. And I'll see you guys in the next Bible study walkthrough.